My name is Jody Shafroff. I'm the director at the Beckett Athenaeum, and we are very excited to be having our author readings kick back in, um, doing it virtually. It's been working very nicely for everyone, um, a way to get to have conversation, especially in the winter, <laughs> is nice, um, considering how isolated we have all been this year, this past year. Um, we have a lot of programming we're working on for 2021, everything from the monthly author reading um, to uh, this coming Tuesday, we had a community conversation on equity and diversity that we are co-sponsoring with the Central Berkshire Regional School District. Um, and later in the month, we have an environmental uh, wild edibles virtual walk uh, with Meredith Baxter of, or Meredith Babcock, sorry, of the Westfield River Wild and Scenic Program uh, facilitating conversation. Um, so keep an eye on our website, on Facebook, um, our newsletters, all of that. And we will um, be sending out more information as we get more programming. If you have other ideas that you would like us to consider for programming, shoot us an email. You can put it in the chat right here um, during our conversation today. Um, we, you can go to beckettathenium.org slash events. Ellen is putting that in the chat window so you can see the links to everything. Um, if you run into trouble with your audio or anything like that, you can chat, you can pull up a chat window and let us know if there's any issue um, with that. Uh, here comes someone else. Um, all of our programming, we are very lucky to have a, a, several foundations uh, who give us grant money each year so that we never have to charge for our programming um, or very, very rarely. Occasionally, there's a very expensive program we, we might have to, but not normally. Um, and the largest contributor to the programming is the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation, specifically the Central Berkshire Fund of that. Um, and a couple of smaller groups, Berkshire Bank gives us some funding, groups like that. So if you have the chance to thank any foundations in the area, either uh, just to thank them for their work or to donate to them, it helps the community. Um, in the meantime, if you know of other authors who might want to do any of the upcoming author readings, send me info on this chat or in the email, advise them to contact us. That's basically how um, Rich and I got talking last month, was he was attending um, Gene Christie's book reading, and he and I stayed on Zoom for a while uh, working out uh, his reading today. So I'm going to turn the conversation over to Richard so he can start uh, the program on Redlined, his book. And then Richard, if you'll let me know when you're ready for me to turn on um, the audio uh, reading, I'll do so. Okay? Well, that's fine. Okay. Well, thank no, It's It's good to see a nice group of folks here. Uh, from my former home in the Berkshires. Uh, I lived in Lenox for, in Pittsfield for 34 years, but recently uh, relocated to Charlottesville, Virginia. Truth is I've been trying to escape New England winters since the day after I was born, but it took uh, 68 years to accomplish it. Um, okay, the book is called Redline, a novel of Boston. And it is a semi-autobiographical novel. In the 1970s, I worked for Saul Alinsky, in a manner of speaking. I was a lead organizer, and I ran projects in Providence, Rhode Island, Boston, Massachusetts, and New Bedford, Massachusetts, over a period of about uh, eight years. Um, one of the things I was involved in was the organizing of a community group in the Jamaica Plains section of Boston. Uh, I arrived there in 1974 and 
what I saw was a typical declining neighborhood. Uh, city services were truncated, schools were a problem, uh, juvenile delinquency, uh, car thefts, building abandonment, arson, and I discovered very quickly redlining. So what I did is I built a, a, a number of block clubs in the more or less traditional Linsky manner where you go block to block and you find the issues on each of them and organize the people around whatever issues they define, whatever issues they see uh, that can be won. And then you go after whoever it is who can make the change that needs to be made, whether it be city officials, slumlords, um, or whoever. So, Redlining is probably the most, the single most important cause of neighborhood decline, particularly urban neighborhood decline. Uh, once uh, the decision is made to draw a red line around a specific area, that neighborhood is essentially doomed. 95% of all houses are, are financed subject to a mortgage. So if you can't get a mortgage, then your house is essentially worthless or worth whatever somebody will pay, pay you in cash. That sets the stage for the moving into the blockbusters and the speculators. And it takes probably a single generation to take a reasonably vibrant neighborhood and turn it into a slum. Um, so I began and we organized a group around this issue and we were successful. Uh, and, the, and the book, I, I like to say half of the book is true and the other half could have been true. But the half that's true uh, does tell the story about of how the neighborhood group was organized and eventually went citywide and how we were successful in stopping the redlining. If you visit the community of Jamaica Plain today, you'll see a diverse and vibrant community and you probably won't be able to afford to buy a house there. But 40 years ago, I was offered one for free. People had moved out of the neighborhood or were moving. They couldn't sell the house and said, Richard, we've been keeping this house up for 20 years. Would you like to have it? Well, I declined that very foolishly because that, that house is worth about $750,000 today. But okay. Um, so we have, uh, back when the book was uh, coming out, we, we, did a, uh, we did an audio version and uh, I hired a, a fellow by the name of Bobby Gaglini. Bobby's from Medford, Massachusetts, which gives him sort of a Boston accent. He's a young guy, he's a professional voice actor. And he did the audible version of the book. Now, he reads a hell of a lot better than I do. So we decided to try out a reading uh, from Bobby rather than, than from me. I also have later on, if, if the, uh, the Q&A leads in that direction, I have a, a shorter segment that I can read myself. But if, uh, if everybody is ready, uh, we'll, uh, we'll commence with, with the reading, which is of chapter one uh, of the book, which is called The Vigil. Chapter 1. The Vigil. February 25th, 1974. Born in the northern Arctic, the icy winds swept due south past a freighter steaming east out of Argentia, Newfoundland. Veered west, curled around the rock-bound main coast, hummed a tune through the rigging of the Boston lightship, crossed Boston Harbor, swept up the corridor between Columbus Ave and the Jamaica Way, ruffled the steel-gray surface of Jamaica Pond, 
funneled through the narrow canyon of double-deckers packed along Jamaica Plains Green Street, then cut like a sharpened blade through a down jacket and several layers of wool and sent a shiver tap dancing up the spine of the young neighborhood organizer who stood lonely vigil on a cold winter's night. It was half past midnight, and Sandy Morgan was still alive. She rocked up onto her toes and stamped her feet. The night was black and as bitter as the dregs at the bottom of her cardboard coffee cup. The young woman gazed up at the stars shining like icy pinpricks in a cold black shroud. She crumpled the cup in her hand and started to toss it in the trash-strewn alleyway, then hesitated. No, no, mustn't let her, she whispered to herself, grinned and stuffed the crushed cardboard cup deep into the side pocket in her down parka. Very sexy, Sandy. You look like a corn dog wrapped in a blue bun. That was her roommate Sarah's verdict the day she wore the new parka back to the dorm. Didn't Allie McGraw wear something like this in Love Story? Sandy asked, twisting side to side, admiring her new purchase in the full-length mirror. Sarah was an Ivy League wannabe, and Allie McGraw was Sarah's role model. She had seen Love Story, like, a gazillion times and Sandy had bought the parka partially as a protest against her roommate's stultifyingly conservative style of dress. Yeah, well, she thought, wrapping her arms around her chest and hugging herself close. I'd rather be a warm corn dog than a frozen french fry on a night like this. She leaned back against the door, her eyes closed, her lips curled into a smile as her mind drifted back to a golden August afternoon. For the moment, she forgot the cold, forgot that she stood shivering in the cramped shadow of a cellar doorway, guarding one of a serried row of hulking tenements, their darkened windows gazing with sightless eyes over Green Street. Instead, she stood engrossed in the gurgling melody that played against the smooth hull of her catboat, her mind recalling only the warmth of her family's carefree Nantucket summers. She felt herself falling and instinctively reached out and steadied herself against the peeling doorframe. Whoa, there's Suze. Let's try to stay awake. She stretched her back, then pushed back her sleeve, exposed the glowing watch dial, and sighed. 12.50 a.m. Just ten minutes since the last check. She glimpsed something out of the corner of her eye. Her breath caught. Is that a light in the first floor window? She narrowed her eyes and studied the window. Must be seeing things. She stamped her feet, checked her watch again. Shit! She had been standing in the doorway now for an hour and a half. Easy, Sandy girl, she admonished herself. Don't go getting all squirrely on me. Sandy had stopped by the old stone church that served as the project's office just after 10 p.m. to pick up a file. Her meeting with a couple of block club leaders had run late. The ladies had won a commitment from the city to have a neighborhood fire trap boarded up in record time, and the buzz of power was as heady as it was unfamiliar to a pair of working-class Boston Irish housewives. She and her boss, Jedediah Flint, had discussed the surveillance and the wisdom of her getting an early start. Does this guy ever sleep? Or take nourishment? She wondered. Flint sat alone in the project's office lounging in his swivel chair, feet up on the desk, with the phone cradled in the crook of his hunched left shoulder. A white porcelain coffee mug stood by his right hand. The office was an open-plan cube farm. Movable dividers separated it into a crossword puzzle of workstations, one for each of the staff organizers. The eight-foot fluorescent tubes mounted in the ceiling lit up the interior like a fish market. Flint nodded in recognition, spat a few quick words into the black mouthpiece, dropped it into its cradle, and swung his feet onto the floor. You're up late, he said. Yeah, the block club victory meeting just ended, she said. Flint looked up and rubbed his chin. How'd it go? he asked. Really well. The city is scheduled to board up early next week. Armed with Sandy's research and tactical advice, the two ladies had led the charge to secure the abandoned property. It had been a short, tough fight between the neighborhood group and the Boston Building Commissioner. You should have seen the commissioner's face. It was a thing of beauty. He asked to speak with two representatives, then opened the door, and, like you suggested, the whole group filed in. Kids and all. 
pretty big office, but they filled it up like an overstuffed sandwich. Told him they'd been complaining for a year and refused to budge. Flint grinned. Then what happened? Well, he got real nervous. Tried the usual bureaucratic shuffle, state regulations, blah, blah, blah. He's running around trying to keep the kids from snatching up the little ornaments he had all over his desk. So, after a year of BS over that fire trap, the people weren't buying it. The man was really shocked when Molly corrected him and quoted the relevant passage of the state sanitary code from memory. They left with a date. Keep your adversary off balance. Congratulations. How's the leadership feeling? Oh, the ladies? They're on a power high. There's a group of neighborhood kids want the city to build a street hockey rink, and the block club is already making plans to help them get it. Sandy stood with her feet apart and her hands on her hips. Looked down at Flint. You think anybody's going to try to torch that building before midnight, boss? She asked. He shrugged. Hard to say. Supposed to be a cold snap all this week? She said. He shrugged. Yeah, it'll be cold. Your call. He said. Yeah, right, she said. She saw right through the feigned indifference. He was being cute, manipulating her, and she resented it. But then, what did she expect? Keeping the place from being burned down before the city had a chance to board it up was her problem. And she knew that she had to deal with it. She was scared of being out there late at night, but wasn't ready to admit it to herself, and she was never going to admit it to him. She and Flint had an odd sort of relationship. He's definitely a sexist, she decided. Though at one point she had fantasized about a night in bed with him. What makes you so sure, Jedediah? About the burning, I mean. His dark eyes rounded briefly at her use of his full first name. He had a lopsided smile that played off against the sharp angles of his face. He usually called his employees by their last names, and most just called him Jed. He raised his elbows and stretched his long, rangy body. Come on, Morgan. You've done the math, except those properly boarded up. Every vacant building within two or three blocks of the corridor has been torched. The question is, who is doing it and why? The one your club has scheduled for a board up fits the pattern, and if memory serves, you were the first one to notice that pattern. Sandy shrugged her long, heavy bag onto an unoccupied desk and slumped down into the chair. Yeah, even a couple bordering the corridor that were well-boarded were torched. But is there really a pattern? In my big mouth, huh? She said. Too many games of Monopoly when I was a kid, I guess. Flint smiled at her. Yeah, well, nobody else noticed. Shows you've been paying attention. Her eyes looked boldly back at him. The color was arresting, disconcerting. China Blue, one of the other young organizers had called them. Really? That sounds almost like a compliment, boss. Flint smiled. Well, don't let it go to your head, Morgan. There are a lot of homeless types looking for a place to crash. They break in make fires to keep warm, piss all over the floor, strip out the copper to buy booze or drugs, and the fire just gets away from them. Like you said in the staff meeting, lately it's been happening too damn quick and nobody even bothers with the copper. Any word from the district fire chief's office? So far I can't get anyone from the district to return my calls, he said with a thin smile. Better make up a Freedom of Information Act request. Get one of your leaders to sign it. They know they have to respond to that. Talk to one of the flat catchers over at Little City Hall. She claims all the fires are thoroughly investigated, Mr. Flint. He raised his hands and dropped them in a gesture of helplessness. She made a face. Guess I better write a letter. So what's the point? Insurance? Doesn't seem to be a reason. Fire insurance? On Green Street? Good luck getting any insurance company to write a new policy in your neighborhood or anywhere else in Central J.P., the whole area is redlined. Redlined? You've mentioned that before, but I really can't say that I understand it all that well. Flint hesitated and gazed at her for a moment to make sure that she wasn't pulling his chain. Sandy, he knew, typically came on like she knew it all, even when she didn't. 
It's complicated. The Northwest Community Organization in Chicago was the first people's organization to get a handle on it. Got an organizer from NPA. That's National People's Action. A fellow by the name of Trap coming in to run a staff training session. Basically, redlining happens when the banks or the insurance companies or all of the above get together and draw a big red circle on a map around parts of the city that they consider too risky to do business with. So they write off the whole neighborhood? You got it. And once that happens, kiss the central neighborhood goodbye. 95% of all residential housing sales are sold subject to a mortgage. And to get a mortgage, you must have insurance. So... Catch-22. You can't get one, you don't get the other. If mortgage or the other insurance money is choked off, the housing market collapses, which sets the stage for slumlords buying cheap for cash, racial steering, and housing abandonment. Redlining is the underlying economic cause of most of the shit we've been organizing around. So basically, all the properties in Central JP are worthless? Yeah, well, there it is, he said, rocking back in his chair. She noted the stubble on his cheeks and the dark smudges under his smoke-gray eyes. You ever read the novel Gone with the Wind, he asked. Yeah, when I was like about 12. Why? Well, there's a scene where Melanie is questioning Rhett Butler about how he made all his money. You recall he was a smuggler dodging the Yankee blockade to bring supplies into southern ports during the Civil War? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so Melanie finally overcomes her proper Southern manners and asks the question. And he says, There is more money to be made out of the wreckage of a civilization than from the building of one. Sandy rolled her eyes. Yeah, right. Okay, I get it. Exactly. Okay, but what's with the corridor anyhow? I mean, whose bright idea was that? Happened before my time. A bunch of community groups got together to stop I-95 running right through the middle of the neighborhood. Finally got the governor to stop it, but not until the whole thing was demoed in from Route 128 to Roxbury. What you see is what's left. A partially demolished, six-lane cancer eating out the guts of the neighborhood, Flint said. She stood up. Yeah, looks like Berlin after the Blitz and only a couple blocks down from my abandoned house. Okay, I'll get set up as soon as I leave here. But what do I do if I see anybody? Stay out of sight. Hide in an alley between the buildings or just stay in the shadows. If you see anyone or anything suspicious, try for a description or a license plate. Then get the fuck out of there. Call the cops, the fire department, and then call me. And if it's late and you're home asleep? I'm serious, Morgan. Don't take any chances. People who torch houses are not the kind of fuckers you want to screw around with. Call me if you see anything suspicious. No matter what time, day or night, you just call me, okay? Aye, aye, sir, she said and tossed off a mock salute. Sandy! Okay, okay, I get it. I'll call. He had just used her first name and she felt absurdly pleased. He picked up his cup and cradled it between his hands. Chances are these guys are professionals. They're going to show up in some kind of vehicle and be in and out quick. Try for a description of the car, and above all, a license plate. Look, can't you get any help? What about your leadership? The whole neighborhood is watching the house, but Kathy and Mrs. Sheehan both work third shifts. People have to sleep. Nobody else? Molly Regan. She lives just up the street. She loves this kind of shit. Keeps a lookout on the street all day long. Writes down the license numbers of the cars that stop. But she's an old lady and she turns in early. Looks like it's down to me. I can hang out in the cellar doorway along the side of her house, though. It's almost right across the street. Right. Okay, good. You need some help? I can assign one of the guys to spell you. Not one of those assholes, she thought. She liked her three male colleagues well enough, but like most guys, they were a bunch of chauvinists. She'd be damned if she showed anything that could be interpreted as female weakness. She'd never live it down. 
She propped her hands on her hips. It's only a few days. You think I can't handle it? You say one thing to any of those guys, and I walk right now. Flint stood up and held both hands palms forward. I never said you couldn't handle it, but it's spooky late at night. If there are guys out there systematically torching houses, it could get seriously dangerous if they catch on to you. I'm a grown woman, and I can handle anything any of the guys can. So Green Street is my territory, and that makes it my problem. Right? Right. Okay. That means I'll deal with it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let me just find that section, and I'll start where the audio left off. Okay, Sandy grabbed the strap of her bag and hiked it up onto her shoulder, turned and strode straight through the vestibule and out the door without another word. Jedediah watched her exit, admiring the slim retreating figure in tight jeans. He stood still until he heard the outside door slam and then shook his head slowly side to side and sighed. My, 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 he thought. Keep your eyes on the prize, my son, because there surely lies the road to perdition. Flint sat down at his desk, propped his feet up, picked up the phone, and dialed. Sandy was cold, tired, and bored. She had been on watch for going on three hours. And aside from the roar of the occasional car passing two blocks up on Center Street, nothing was happening. She let her eyes pass along the string of houses that lined the far side of the street like a picket line. Some were broader, hunched shouldered, some thicker waisted, but in the end, they were just rectangular boxes that gradually merged into the shadows as they worked out their way down the hill towards Lamartine Street. She looked up towards Center Street and noticed a dark profile of a church steeple thrusting into the sky like a fat stalk of asparagus above the squat commercial buildings at the head of the street. What, she idly wondered, are church steeples supposed to represent? A spear or maybe something else like one of those lingams that they have in India? But then she giggled. They wouldn't end in a point. Shifting from foot to foot to keep her eyes to keep her toes from freezing, Sandy Morgan began to regret her own stubbornness. Had Flint played her? Maybe it was her own pride that baited her into a knee-jerk macho feminist response. She looked up and batted her eyes. Oh, Mr. Man, big, strong Mr. Man, she said half aloud. It's so cold and dark out here. I just don't know what I'm ever going to do could you please come over here and rescue poor little helpless me? She giggled. That was mom all over. How many times she should stood by and watched her mother go into that helpless routine? Her dumb schmuck of a father bought it every time until that is, he had run off with his 20 something secretary. She was the helpless type too. But with big blue eyes and even bigger tits, Sandy winced. The breakup had really hurt. She'd been daddy's little girl. The sound of a car engine broke into a reverie. She pressed herself back into the doorway just as a dark sedan with its lights out cruised past her and glided to a stop at the right hand curb beyond the light pole in front of the vacant house. What happened to the street light? Shit, that's funny. It was on last night, wasn't it? Damn. The street side car door opened slightly and the courtesy light lit up the car's interior. <coughs> hey, Joey, douse that fucking light. The deep growl of a male vo voice caught, carried cleanly through the chill, dark night. The light outlined the head and shoulders of four men, two in front and two in back. 
Sandy made a mental note. All four appeared to be white. The door was pulled closed and the top car interior went black. Then the back doors opened. This time there was no light. Two men, dark shadows emerged from either side of the vehicle <coughs> and quietly pressed the doors shut. Sandy felt the adrenaline surge. She was now fully alert. She could barely see the man on the street side. He bent down and picked something up. She couldn't make out what it was, then circled around the back of the car, stepped over the snowbank and joined the other guy on the sidewalk. The car eased away from the curb and dropped down the hill towards Lamartine. The two men merged into the spidery shadows cast by the tall bare limbed tree on the opposite side of the street. She squinted but the men had been swallowed up by the night. She waited a few minutes. All seemed quiet. Then out of the corner of her eye, she caught a glint of light off metal and a car, had to be the same car, emerged like a black beetle out of the gloom. It rolled to a stop beneath the tree less than 30 feet from where Sandy stood hugging herself in the darkness. Sandy's eyes flicked back to where she had last seen the two men, gone. The hair prickled along the back of her neck. Something sure as hell was going on, she thought. She felt exposed, vulnerable. The faint purr of the car engine tickled her ear. Then the sharp sound of splintering wood ripped through the stillness. The back door has to be she thought. Despite the hiking boots and the double ski socks, her feet were going numb. Maybe it was the excitement. She flexed her toes and rubbed her gloves hands together. Was that a light in the front window? She whispered out loud. She checked her watch. The dial glowed. 1.30 a.m. and Sandy Morgan was still alive. So that's the I hope I did a better job. Bobby, Bobby certainly did a better job in the Audible book. I don't know what happened with, with, the, with the audio here. Yeah, sorry about that. It sounded loud and clear and crystal on my end, but clearly there were some oh. issues. So Richard, are you ready for, for, today for everyone to unmute, take turns asking questions? Sure. Or if people okay. who don't want to answer question, I can read another section of the book or <laughs> whatever you would like. Yeah. And we can always go back and forth between the two. Sure. Go ahead. Lynn, you have to unmute. Let's see. There's a mute button down in the left corner. Okay. Your screen, I, I I, I, can you hear me now? Yes. Sure. Yeah, yes, perfect. I feel badly because at the very beginning, I, I really missed, I, I couldn't, I was, I, I, I couldn't understand what was happening. But is what this is about is the redlining. These are neighborhoods that were going to just fall into to nowhere, that you blocked off areas. This is what your book is about. And this particular section in, in parts, chapter one, is the woman in the car to be watching to see if somebody's going to hurt this house? I, I've kind of missed what's happening. It sounds like it's going to be a very good book and very interesting, but I need you to explain a little more to me. Maybe I should read the section that nobody could hear. Yeah, I, <laughs> that might. Well, maybe other people could understand it. Am I the only one that didn't quite understand? Yeah. No, I don't think so. We, we would miss some words and parts. It was hard <laughs> to get the overview earlier. Okay, good. Well, I would love for somebody to explain okay. some of it to me. <laughs> me too. Well, I guess the only way to explain a novel is to read it, really. Ah, uh, okay. So why don't I just go back <laughs> and read the section before the section I just read, and hopefully that won't 
okay. be too confusing. Does that make sense? No, if you could just su uh, summarize what 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 the uh, station was about, I think that would be enough help. Yes, okay. I agree. San Sandy Morgan is a neighborhood organizer. She's working with a block club. Now, a block club is just a small neighborhood organization uh, that's organized around a block. And when you in 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 these crowded urban neighborhoods, often uh, there are issues block by block. So if you organize block by block, then you begin to build a coalition of organizations eventually, which was essentially the Alinsky model. So Sandy is a neighborhood organizer, and what she's doing is she's watching a house, an abandoned building that's been boarded up on her in her on her block because there has been a rash of arsons. Okay, that's what I thought, okay. Right, in, in Jamaica Plain at that time, the, the um, an abandoned house had about a week to 10 days before it was broken into, torched and trashed. That was the life expectancy of an abandoned building at that time. So what she's trying to do, since the city hasn't, you know, the board, of, when the city boarded up a house properly, it was boarded up pretty well. It's pretty hard to get into it. But prior to that, you know, it was a target. It was a, it was a fire trap. It was an arson waiting to happen. So she's guarding this building essentially in the middle of the night. And She's essentially uh, doing this on the behest of the neighborhood group. So she's working with a neighborhood group and they are also spending time guarding it, but she is as well. And they're trying to prevent it from being burned down before it can be boarded up. Because if it's boarded up, there's a potential to rehab it. If it burns down, what have you got? A vacant lot. And then once you have a vacant lot, what happens then? You get the vacant lot fills with trash and essentially lot by lot, you're tearing the neighborhood down. And the objective of the organizing was to stabilize and save the neighborhood. So that's the vigil was about, it was in that section. Now I can read the last part, which I think might be a good idea of this uh, scene in that, in essence. Richard, you just heard, yeah. could you also explain um, how the bank's involvement in the neighborhoods affected all of this also, maybe right before the reading? Sure, well- Because I know that they had a, a strength play in the- Right. Well, redlining started in the 1930s. It was created by the federal government. FHA um, drew maps of most of the major cities. You know, prior to the 1930s, uh, it was home ownership was a very difficult thing. Mortgages, private mortgages, uh, typically were five to seven years in length, and you and you built no equity. Essentially, you paid off the interest on the loan, and at the end of the loan, at the termination of the loan, you had no equity in the house, so you had a problem. FHA created the 20 year mortgage, which was a very good thing because it, it essentially stimulated what we now today now is home ownership. But when they did it, they did something else which was very bad. They drew red lines around urban neighborhoods, which they decided were not good bets for an insured FHA mortgage. And what made those neighborhoods not a good bet? Black people. Even a sprinkling of black people in a given neighborhood, even if that neighborhood was perfectly viable, meant that it was not eligible for an FHA loan. Also black people themselves were excluded from FHA loans and were excluded from the Veterans Administration loans after World War II. Right. So essentially the government created the urban ghettos that we see today 
because essentially it was all about mortgaging, right? If you couldn't, if you couldn't get a mortgage, you couldn't buy a house. If you couldn't get a mortgage, you couldn't sell a house. So this whole question of wealth, you know, the, in the city of Boston, the uh, median uh, white families, I believe net worth is $220. The median uh, wealth uh, of a black person is $8. Why? Because we know the foundation of middle-class wealth is equity in homes. And, and black and, uh, and other minorities were simply denied the right, regardless of their credit worthiness, regardless of how good the neighborhood might in fact be, hmm. essentially denied access to the, those credit markets. Now in Boston, Jamaica Plain or the central, the central neighborhood of Jamaica Plain between Center and Washington Street was redlined. So people who were there, often the sons and daughters, sometimes the grandchildren of the original Irish folks who had built the two and three deckers, brought their relatives over from the old country and essentially, you know, were part of the building of what we know as mod modern America. They were in these neighborhoods and a lot of them were trying to go to the suburbs, but they couldn't go because they couldn't sell their home. And the people who wanted to come in, the urban pioneers and, and other, other people who saw an opportunity to buy a house at a reasonable price, and it was some great housing stock in Jamaica Plain, still is, um, the market was, was not there. So, I could go in there with $30,000 maybe and buy myself two or three properties, maybe three deckers, convert those three deckers to rental units. Then I could go to the welfare department, sign up for section eight, uh, bring in welfare families, get direct payments from the welfare department, do nothing. And in some cases, in one case that we found not even pay the taxes because it took five years for the city to foreclose. And, you know, there was one building down the street from my office uh, where the, the fellow who owned it, he had 24 unit apartment building. He had made a quarter of a million dollars out of a $5,000 investment. And guess what? He was a housing inspector of the city of Boston. He bought the property. He removed in the tenants, he got the direct payments, so he didn't have to worry about the tenants because the welfare department was paying him. He did no maintenance. He didn't pay his taxes. Five years later, the city foreclosed and another guy bought it. Oddly enough, the guy who bought it had the same address as the guy who was foreclosed. On. So that's, you know, <clears throat> multiply that through a neighborhood with say, 5,000 housing units over a period of 20 years. And what do you think is going to happen? You're going to end up with an urban slum. You're going to take a perfectly good neighborhood and turn it into an urban slum. Uh, and the Boston banks had done that. And uh, we were able to figure it out. We figured it out. I had a, a woman who researched it. She went back to this uh, was a weekly publication called the Banker and Tradesman. I don't know if it's still around. And she went back through five years of week, weekly Banker and Tradesman and made graphs of all the mortgages that had been granted in Jamaica Plain over that five years and showed a graph that was uh, declining. The banks said, oh, no, we're not redlining. The um, commissioner, commissioner of banks said, we don't care what they do. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. They have no, absolutely no duty to protect their mortgagees even. And that was the situation when we began. Because the first meeting we had was with the Boston Banking Commissioner. And you can go back in the Boston Globe in 1974 and you can find the article where she says exactly that. We have no responsibility to the people. Our responsibility is to the banks and the bank's responsibility is to their stockholders. So 
that was the situation in Boston and in, in many, many other places. But the, the novel is about the organizing effort to stop them. Thank you for the background on that, Richard. I, okay, that any, any questions that. about that? No, it was very well done, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll read chapter three, which is the end of the scene with Sandy Morgan. Sandy Morgan hugged herself to keep warm and waiting for the two men to return. She had been fighting a cold all week and could feel the beginnings of a headache. 10 minutes passed. Finally, they reappeared and sauntered out into the, onto the sidewalk. One was carrying what looked like some sort of container, but the thick shadows made it impossible to make a definite identification. They came from the back of the house, all right. She stared at the front window, expecting at any moment to see, a, see the bright licking tongues of flame, but all remained dark. The men crossed the street, walked up to the car and got in. Doors slammed. The car accelerated and as it passed Sandy's hiding place, the lights, headlights flicked on. Gotcha, she said out loud. She pulled a pencil and notebook out of her pocket and scribbled down the license number. The brake lights flashed briefly as the car made a right onto Center Street and all was quiet. Nothing stirred. It was as if the night itself held its breath. Okay, half an hour, she whispered, checking her watch. I'll wait. If nothing happens, I'm out of here. Her teeth chattered. The wind cut through the stretched material of her jean clad, clad legs as she waited. Am I really cold or just chicken, she asked herself. 15 minutes later, she stepped out onto the sidewalk, looked both ways, then darted across the street, jogged down the sidewalk, ducked into the dark corridor alongside the house and made her way to the back door. The steady pumping of her heart was audible in her ears. The plywood planking that had been nailed across the door frame had been torn off and lay on the ground. The door was ajar. The snowy area around the stoop was a jumble of footprints. She could just make out the dull gleam of the metal fence that separated the backyard from the adjacent property. She took off one glove reached into her pocket, grasped a handful of keys with her fingers, picking out the small metal pen light attached to her key ring and pushed the tiny button. A weak yellow beam flickered, barely penetrating the darkness. Oh shit, not now, she swore. She shook the pen light and the beam brightened. Yes, God, she said, and solemnly promising herself to replace the batteries first thing, pushed open the door and stepped into the narrow entryway. It was damp, dark, and smelled of mold. She swung the beam. To her left, she could see the door to the first floor apartment. To the right, a narrow oak wainscoted stairway disappeared upwards into the murky darkness leading to the second floor. <coughs> Sandy twisted the knob on the apartment door and pushed. The door swung inward with a raspy creak. Shit, the fucking house of Usher. Her voice sounded hollow, but reassuring. The raw cobwebby cellar smell ass assaulted her nostrils. She shivered. She was out of the wind, and but the dark air cut through her jeans and she could feel it penetrate down to the bone. The room she had entered was obviously the kitchen. She caught a glimpse of a patterned linoleum floor. She played the feeble beam of her pen light over the wall. The original wood grain wainscoting had been painted over. <coughs> Battered metal cabinets were bolted to the wall. The cabinet doors gaped open like dark mouths. It looked as if someone had cleaned out the contents and left in a big hurry. <coughs> Above the cabinets, she saw large scabs of peeling paint and spatters of what looked like mold. God, it's cold, she whispered. Technically, she thought, <coughs> I'm trespassing. Technically, hell, what do I say if the cops show up? What do I tell them I'm doing here, she asked, but got no answer. She took a deep breath. Okay, one quick look-see and I'm gone. 
Placing one foot carefully in front of the other, she moved toward the half open right hand door. She felt something under her foot, but didn't look down. She thought she heard the crunch of breaking glass. She stepped over the threshold, played the thin beam of the light over the walls. The room was small, rectangular, and empty. In the middle of the ceiling, a fly-specked light bulb dangled at the end of a frayed cord like the victim of a lynching. She shook her head as her light played over the garish pattern of large cabbage roses. Whoa, somebody had seriously poor taste in a decorator. She stepped forward and her foot squished down on something soft and yielding. Yuck, Sandy took a breath and directed her light downward. It was a white mound of gunk crumbled under her foot. She played the light up at the ceiling. It was a large ragged section of opposed, exposed lath. She heard a sharp cracking sound and froze in mid stride. What the, oh shit. She stood perfectly still, strained her ears and waited. Nothing, probably just a rat. Sandy tiptoed to the end of the room, flattened her back against the wall next to the paired windows that overlooked the street and held her breath and peered out, empty. She exhaled gratefully, turned and tiptoed back the way she had come, turned right and pushed. It was one of those old fashioned solid swinging doors that was sometimes used in big houses to divide the dining room from the butler's pantry. It seemed odd to find one in this small apartment. Maybe the house had once been a single family and this was the door between the kitchen and the dining room. Yes, that would explain it, she thought. The room was considerably larger and it was not empty. A stack of geometric shapes that might have been furniture had been assembled in the center of the room and covered over with some kind of tarp. At the far end of the room, a bay of three tall windows, the shape of a half hexagon jutted out on over the street. She stepped gingerly skirting a the pile, her feet crunching broken glass and made her way to the window and looked out. Silent as the grave, she whispered. Oh, shut up, Sandy. She sniffed the air. The same dank, wet, moldy newspaper smell, but different this time, overlaid with a sharper odor. She sniffed again. The acrid smell was familiar, but she couldn't quite identify it. The pen line flick light flickered and the room went black. Damn, not now, just what I don't need, she whined. She shook the pen light and the light flickered on. She was breathing heavily. Thank you, God. Better get a move on. This light is not going to last much longer, she said out loud. The stink of the place had made her headache worse. Time to get the fuck out of here, take a couple of aspirins and get some sleep. I'll call Jed Flint tomorrow. He will no doubt have a few bright ideas. She turned to retrace her steps out of the corner of her eye and caught the tiny glint of something coming from the center of the pile. A little flicker that made her breath catch. Sandy tiptoed to the edge of the pile. She put her hand on the canvas. Whatever it covered felt solid. She stood up on her toes and leaned forward to look over the top. The sharp smell was much stronger. The canvas was wet and so was her hand. She sniffed at it this time. Even with a stuffed up nose, the odor was unmistakable. Nail polish remover? She asked herself out loud. Her eye caught a flicker of light. Suddenly, it was all too clear. She understood why men had come into this vacant building in the small hours of a cold winter night. Oh my Jesus God. The adrenaline rush hit her like a sledgehammer. She pushed herself upright, sidestepped around the pile and launched herself towards the dark rectangle of the doorway. She was terrified, a panicked animal with only one narrow focus, escape. Just for a millisecond, a flicker of regret. I should have snuffed it out. But for Sandy Morgan, the thought arrived just a bit too late. From behind her, a sound erupted like a wind rushing through the mouth of a narrow canyon. 
Sandy felt herself being lifted off her feet and propelled forward like an errant leaf in the wind. Her face smashed into something hard and her world exploded in blinding light and searing pain. It was 2.15 a.m. Sandy Morgan was no longer alive. So now you know the story, <laughs> the beginning anyway. That's the end of chapter three. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Richard. Um, uh, having read your book, I know it to be uh, a very enter entertaining uh, combination of uh, the social issues that we <clears throat> that you have discussed today, but there's also a, a kind of a pot boiler element. So uh, for those who are listening today, uh, joining the group, who have not yet read the book, could you give us uh, a hint or two uh, about the rest of the book and how the Catholic Church hierarchy entered into your story? and how the uh, criminal gangs of Chinatown come into the picture? Well, let's see, that's a little hard to do without spoilers, but suffice it to say that the redlining is not the only thing that's going on in this neighborhood. There's a reason why all of these houses, these buildings are being burned, particularly buildings as it said in the first part of the chapter, which you probably didn't hear because of the audio problem, that near the corridor, this six lane demolished corridor, which was meant to be Route I-95 going through the heart of Boston. You know, if you travel I-95 from Maine to Florida, it goes straight line, right? Except for one place, Boston. <laughs> because the people of Boston stopped it from going through the middle of the neighborhood. But by the time they had stopped it, the corridor had been demolished. So right in the center of Jamaica Plain, you had this demolished six, eight lane, no man's land. And the arsons were, were focused around this corridor. And all right, so what did you have? You had a cancer eating out the guts of the neighborhood as, as Flint describes it. You've got this no man's land, people going in and out of it. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. <coughs> and everybody sees it as this worthless hunk of land. But what it also is, is an eight lane corridor from Route 128 into the heart of Boston. Right, a corridor from Route 128 into the heart of Boston. Pretty valuable piece of property if it were used properly, isn't it? And that's the second plot. The, the, the essence of the second plot is the Southwest Corridor and who's after it and why. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, any other questions? Um, Who are all these folks that are just names down here? Are they here or are they just... Yes, sir, you had a question. Yeah, so um, I'm Steve Broder. Richard, uh, thanks for the reading. Um, well, the first part was a bit tinny, so we couldn't hear. Yeah. And, and your voice is terrific um, itself oh, as a you. reader. So, <laughs> so in the future, don't, uh, don't underestimate yourself. But the book is very exciting. I'll make sure to look for it. Very suspenseful. Um, just a couple of connections to it. Um, so I live in the very corner of Newton, West Brock, Roxbury, and Brookline, not too far oh. from JP, which is one of my favorite places. In fact, for years I've called 
uh, Jamaica Plain, Cambridge on the other side of the river, because oh, yeah. the old days of Harvard Square in the um, late 60s, 70s, uh, it's a shame what's turned, what's happened with Harvard Square with all the interesting and funky little shops um, that mm -hmm. uh, Center Street and different areas of Jake, Jamaica Plain have become. So it's a, a great place to go. Um, it was also fun because I used to live in Medford and you mentioned, I think the, the reader was from there. And yes. I, I've met and I know Joanna Linsky and her husband, she's the daughter-in-law of, of Saul um, who lives in this, this area. Um, so does so David. And David. I don't know David as well, but I know I know jo Joanne. Um, uh, I was wondering, given sort of the, the terrible events in Washington and last week and everybody talking about violence and the, the undercurrent and maybe not so far under in your book about violence, um, I was curious if you yourself had gotten any pushback, um, and I'll say pushback, uh, sort of, you know, um, softly, from the different groups and institutions that you take to task, politicians, um, the banking industry, various people who benefited slum, slum lords, and I just wonder that, you know, you're really stepping yourself into some area that people are really not going to like? Well, uh, not, not since the publication of the book. In the, in the 70s, I got a hell of a lot of pushback. And some of it, you know, you know I was a commie as far as, uh, as far as the, oddly enough, uh, a lot of the community organizing was funded by the Catholic Church, uh, by the Campaign for Human Development, which was more or less the radical arm of Catholic charities. But when you got into the neighborhoods and you're dealing with the local pastors, it was a whole different thing. Some of them were quite right wing. Uh, and uh, so there was a, an interesting dichotomy. Uh, since the publication of the book, if that's what you're asking, I haven't really experienced anything but a few one star reviews, uh, you know, that seem to have no reason. They just bang, they're there, you know? So the, there are a lot of folks, I think, you know, Saul Alinsky was, was, has been demonized uh, mainly by the Republican party uh, who were out to demonize Barack Obama really, but uh, used, uh, used Alinsky as a battering ram to do that. And of course, Alinsky, methodology is very effective so it's in the it's it's in the interest of the powers that be to to, to talk about how terrible it is mm -hmm. how it's you know he's a devil or it was a devil worshiper and he commie and all of this sort of stuff all of which is a lie um but you know it's been an effective lie because it's been repeated over and over we know about that right if you repeat something over and over Don, the Donald has taught us a little bit about that. If you repeat something over and over, sooner or later, a lot of people believe you, right? But yeah, I got a lot of pushback when I was an organizer. I mean, really, you know, you had to watch your back all the time. Um, and and it's it, that's chronicled in the book. The, uh, the local state rep was after me. His name was, uh, what the heck was his name now? I'll remember it in a minute. And he did his best to do me in. Um, and the bankers weren't real happy with me either, I might add. Um, so, you know, we got a lot of pushback in those days, but 50, 45 years later, not so much. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I stopped organizing at the end of the 70s and became a dealer in gemstones. And, is a little bit different kind of a thing, right? I had a gallery in Lenox, downtown Lenox, right? Yeah. Where there are no black people at all. 
<laughs> you know, I wonder if you had heard um, uh, also in terms of redlining that the banks did around here was not just black and brown people, but also in some of the neighborhoods around Jews. And when I came to Boston, yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm a psychologist. I came to train at Mass General in 79. I, I learned later from some people who had been around here earlier that there were code words, like in Wellesley, the code word for Jews was Canadians. And people <laughs> talked about not selling. I don't know if you ever heard this, was not selling to Canadians. And people would, and it was, just among the various codes that people used to keep out different groups. Yeah, well, of course, that's, you know, we've experienced that in many neighborhoods. Some, some neighborhoods where if you, you know, in mostly WASP neighborhoods, if you're Jewish, you can't buy there. Some Jewish neighborhoods where if you're a Gentile, it's tough to buy there. I mean, that kind of discrimination goes on. Yeah. But uh, redlining itself uh, is much more comprehensive and, and much more dangerous and much more damaging because it was a federal program. I didn't know this, by the way. Yeah. I, I knew the proximate cause and what redlining did, but I didn't really know all of this history. Uh, there's a book out called The Color of Law by, uh, I think his name is Richard Rothstein. If you want to understand it, he does a marvelous job and and it does a comprehensive analysis of it across the country and the impact that it's had and it's astonishing but if you think about it uh you know you go into a we used to go into a neighborhood and we'd see all these problems and we said well all right well you can board up the abandoned building you can uh chase out the slumlord you can make the city fix the street light or put in a working fire hydrant or approach the schools and what have you but you know what started it and the myth was well you know you have a couple of there's a couple of welfare people who moved in the neighborhood and there goes the neighborhood right mm -hmm. or there's you know there's a black people black people black family moved in next door and as soon as that happens because that myth was pervasive and that's what blockbusting was all about. You know, you'd move, they'd move a black person, some real estate guy would move a black person in the neighborhood, then you'd go around the neighborhood shaking up all the white people and then offering to buy cheap for cash and turn the whole neighborhood over. So uh, the, 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 uh, the awareness of, of redlining really started in Chicago among the Alinsky organizations like the OBA and, and Woodlawn began to realize that, you know, you're sticking your finger in the dike and every time you do another, another hole. So when you're, you're really shoveling the shit against the tide by, by, you know, taking an abandoned building and have it torn down and then having a lot, which then filled up with trash and then the next abandoned building, then you got another. So essentially you were destroying the, the neighborhood piecemeal. And the underlying cause was economic as it so often is. Um, so I consider that Boston uh, sojourn that two years I spent. And of course you can see the result if you go to JP today, right? <laughs> I. I, we did a we did our book launch in Jamaica Plain. There's a little Italian restaurant, which unfortunately went out of business. We wanted to do it at Doyle's. Doyle's is in the book set in several chapters. Doyle's is the oldest uh, one of the oldest uh, Irish pubs in Boston. I think it was 1870 or something. And we used to uh, have all our a lot of our planning meetings there. <laughs> we did a lot of planning. Uh, and uh, we couldn't, so we, we had it uh, at this little Italian restaurant. It was amazing. We had like 80 people showed up. Most of them had never heard of me because, you know, it was 45 years late, but uh, it was great. It was fun. We enjoyed, we enjoyed it and uh, sold a few books. So it was, it was, a, it was a lot of fun.
Are you doing any more see. writing these days? Am I doing any more writing? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm writing a book now. It's uh, it's set thirty five thousand years ago in southwestern France. You know, Hemingway said, "Write what you know," which I've done up to this point. But I got kind of bored with that, so I decided to write about something nobody knows about. And that is what was going on there. And uh, the book was, uh, <clears throat> what got me going on the book were the uh, cave paintings at Chauvet. Mm -hmm. Astonishingly powerful and, and te technically sophisticated artwork, which sent me to believing that, you know, those people back there at that time, they did a lot more than uh, scratch under their arms and grunt. Uh, there was a culture, a very sophisticated culture. And so I decided to write about that culture and the clash between it and the Neanderthal culture 35,000 years ago. And the nice thing about that, the good thing about that, or the bad thing about that, or both, is that nobody really knows what happened. So, you know, who can say I was wrong? <laughs> And that's what I'm doing now. It's a lot of a lot of research in it, and I'm enjoying writing it. I think it may be done in a year or two, but I'm in no hurry. Are you gonna? Is it gonna be the first of a series? Or are you gonna take it up to modern day, or you don't know yet? No, it's set. It's set in that the Oregonian period. It's called. It's set back at that time. It begins and ends at that time, and it deals with the clash of cultures. You know. 50,000 years ago, the Neanderthals had been in Europe for 200, between two and 300,000 years. They'd evolved in Europe. 50,000 years ago, modern humans showed up. 5,000 years later, there were no more Neanderthals. What's up with that? And that's kind of the theme of the book, the story. Doesn't tell that whole story, but it intimates what happened. You are a very interesting person. Thank I, you. I agree. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much. Read the book. Great yes. book. I think so. Buy several copies. Give them to your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Give a couple copies to the Beckett Athenaeum, you know. They, okay. I don't know if, if they have. Some, about a dozen libraries has it, has it now, which I'm very gratified by. Uh, Miss Kelleher, White, and Manley, are they really here? I haven't heard a peep out of any of them. I guess they're not going to peep. So is that it? Have, have we done it? Thank, thank you. That was an interesting story. Oh, that, that's Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Yes, hi. Sorry, I was at work, so I had to just listen and not talk much. Well, we're about to close, so if you have any questions. <laughs> I, I don't have questions. I was, uh, I think you kind of uh, did a great summary, and it was very interesting, the part about the banks, too. So I think I might just look into reading the book. Oh, my God, not that. <laughs> thank you and uh, I'd like, uh, like to thank like to thank the Beckett Athenaeum for sponsoring this uh, reading I'm very grateful uh, it's wonderful to talk to people who, uh, who are literate, literate <laughs> or literary and, uh, and, and and it's fun to read you know Although I'd much rather listen to somebody else reading my book. <laughs> and really, if you're thinking about the audible copy, it doesn't break up like, like this reading does. And, and, and Bobby Gaglini does, you know, does a marvelous job with it. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what, what happened here, but probably had something to do with the bandwidth, I suspect. And I thank you all for coming. Yeah, I would imagine. Thank you. Thank Richard, you. thank, thank you, you so much. much for joining us and everyone.
Steve, everyone. It was so good to see your voices all far flung and face some faces and yeah, it, it's helping the winter go, right? And if you know of any authors, please send them our way, okay? Yeah, will do. Okay. Stay healthy, be well. And we I'll, have some I'll, links I'll. in the chat if anyone wants to look further both at Richard's website um, uh, where he has the new, um, or I guess on Facebook also, he has a new release information. And he mentioned the book, yeah, the, the Color e of Law. And we yeah, have e that at the library. Sale. As a matter of fact. <laughs> Phenomenal. Okay. Be well, enjoy your winter. Hope to see you next month with uh, whoever the author is we have. Yeah, thank, okay. you. thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Stay warm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.